So, yeah, I want to talk about monotropism, a theory of autism um, devised by autistic people, including my mother, Dinah Murray, as well as Wen Lawson and the late Mike Lesser. Um, it centres on the idea that in autistic brains, processing resources, including attention, tend to be more tightly focused than they are in non-autistic brains. Autistic people typically pay attention to fewer things at once. Another way to look at this is in terms of interests. Interests being things that our minds are pulled towards. Autistic people tend to have fewer, more intense interests, and crucially, fewer interests aroused at any time. There are many things about autistic experience that this framing helps explain. When they were talking about monotropism early on, Dinah and her colleagues used the metaphor of autistic or monotropic attention being like a, a torch beam, while non-autistic or polytropic attention is more like the diffuse light of a lamp. We could also say that monotropism is akin to spearfishing, while polytropic attention is more like fishing with a net. When I was writing about monotropism for The Psychologist magazine, I settled on this photo of two trees as an illustration. Uh, one heavily branched, the other a smoothly curving trunk. So, the diagnostic criteria in the latest versions of the di diagnostic manuals used by psych psychiatrists and so on, the DSM-5 and the ICD-11, talk about differences, difficulties in interaction and social communication and restricted interests in repetitive behaviours. Montropism is, in my view, the only theory of autism that convincingly and coherently accounts for both of these, and it does it in a way that is not based on deficits, it doesn't assume that there's something wrong with autistic people. It also accounts for other features of autistic experience that are not prominent in the official diagnostic criteria, such as difficulty filtering sensory stimuli, the intensity with which we experience a lot of things, and difficulty switching tasks. So why do we have difficulties in interaction and social communication? It's not because we lack theory of mind or empathy. Many autistic people are highly empathic. However, there are two big things that can make interaction difficult. The first is two-way difficulties with empathy, what the autistic scholar Damien Milton calls a double empathy problem. The truth is that empathy just is difficult, especially with people who experience the world very differently from yourself, and especially with people whose experiences are underrepresented in the stories we hear. People who think it's easy are usually kidding themselves. So yes, autistic people do often find it difficult to empathise with non-autistic people, but non-autistic people find it just as difficult going the other way, and unlike us, they don't have to spend their whole lives practising. The other reason social communication can be different is more directly the result of monotropic processing. Neurotypical social interactions are complex. Monotropic minds lend themselves to processing one, maybe two information streams at a time. But most people expect social interactions to take into account words, tone of voice, facial expressions on both sides, body language, timing, and complex, unexplained social rules which vary depending on who you're interacting with and where. That's just a lot to keep track of. And if you grow up missing most of those channels in most of your interactions, you are naturally going to be at a disadvantage in learning the social rules other people take for granted, and how to express yourself in a way that other people don't find too weird. As for having restricted interests, this follows directly from the monotropic tendency to have only one or two interests aroused at a time, and for them to be more intense than they are for most people. Our interests, or, or passions, are central to our well-being. Even so, restricted interests is a misleading framing for many of us. For my part, I am interested in a huge number of things, even if I do tend to be really passionate about just one or two things at a time. I think when people call our inter interests restricted, they're mostly expressing puzzlement about us not being as interested as they would be in certain things. The intensity of our focus often means that having our attention redirected can feel like a wrench, leaving us deeply frustrated and destabilised. Repetitive behaviours also make perfect sense in the context of monotropism. Partly, they are simply a product of our intense interests. We have a tendency to keep looping back to things, be they interests or behaviours. I think of this in terms of tracks in the mind. Whatever we focus on leaves traces, and we tend to return to well-worn tracks. 
Since monotropic minds tend to focus attention intensely, autistic people are likely to have tracks that we return to again and again. There is another reason for repetitive behaviours in sinning, though, um, which is their ways of coping with overwhelm, the intensity of our experiences, and that feeling of being wrenched out of attention tunnels often leaves us with feelings of overload and instability. Stimming provides predictable input that we're in control of, and that is incredibly helpful for self-regulation and self-soothing. Uh, it's how we recover from the, the crisis of having our attention wrenched away from where we were trying to put it. I sometimes sum up monotropism in six starting points. Um, coping with multiple sensory, multiple channels is hard. Filtering is tricky and error prone, and it takes energy. Changing tracks is destabilizing, partly because you need to make new plans, um, partly because task switching just takes a lot of energy itself. Um, we often experience things intensely, especially things relating to our concerns and interests, uh, and we tend to keep looping back to our interests and our concerns. So this is not just positive things, it's often anxieties as well. Um, it's hard to let things drop. Uh, but other things that do drop out of my awareness tend to stay dropped. It's harder to think about things when they're not in front of me and I don't have reminders. Um, so every theory of autism provides a set of starting points to try and make sense of it, right? So there's the systemizing, empathizing idea of autism which sort of starts from the idea that autistic people like to think about things very systematically and are bad at empathising. Um, there's the executive dysfunction idea, um, suggesting that our executive functioning is essentially just weak, so it's difficult for us to steer our thoughts. Um, and then there's the intense world theory, which is in many ways probably the closest to monotropism as a theory of autism. Although, interestingly, all of these theories have got closer and closer to monotropism over time as their developers have worked on them. Um, the intense world theory starts from the idea that autistic people just in experience things very intensely. Um, and that explains our social difficulties and our intense interests and so on. Um, which I think works up to a point but doesn't really account for the fact that we don't experience everything intensely, it's only some things. Um, all of these theories, to some extent, start from the assumption that autistic people have deficits. They have, we have things wrong with us. Monotropism is almost unique in not assuming that autism is a problem and it's caused by things that are wrong with us. Uh, it sees everybody as being more or less monotropic, less or more polytropic. Um, so it's just an aspect of the diversity of humankind. Um, and yes, being monotropic makes certain things extremely difficult. Uh, most autistic people are disabled in the societies that we live in, but that doesn't mean that it's wrong. <laughs> um, the theory was put forward by, as I say, three autistic people. Um, not all of them had an official diagnosis, but I think it's fair to say that they are, they were all clearly autistic. Um, only one of them was a, at all involved in academic psychology, and none of them really had very much an experimental background. And I think the combination of all of those things, but perhaps especially the fact that the theory came from autistic people, I think all got in the way of it being adopted widely by psychologists. Um, it's just in the last few years, really, with the internet and the ability for autistic people to connect with each other, that it's starting to get much more widely recognised. So, um, I wanted to talk about implications for practice a bit. Um, what does it mean? What should we do differently if we understand about monotropic minds? Um, the, the biggest thing is probably the need to start where the person is. Uh, 
So if you're working with an autistic person, or if you are an autistic person and other people are working with you, then um, accept that the autistic person is likely to be in an attention tunnel, and in order to get through to them, you might need to share that attention tunnel. Uh, another thing is reducing cognitive load. So uh, the number of things that we have to process at any given time plays a large part in determining how much we're able to process them. Um, a lot of distracting stimuli, visual clutter, background noise, um, all requires filtering. Filtering takes energy. Uh, it's likely to make us unable to focus on the things that we're supposed to be fo focusing on. Um, because of our tendency to get into attention tunnels and to have what I call autistic inertia, uh, not my term, widely used in the community, uh, it takes time to change tracks and that's something that you need to build in. Um, the need to self-regulate is absolutely crucial and there are still people working with autistic people who try to stop us from stimming um, and that just makes it so much harder to cope with life. Um, making the most of intense interests really can get you a long way. So connect with your passions, connect with your friends' passions and your kids and whoever. Um, never treat special interests as a problem. Uh, if, if possible, make connections between intense interests and whatever else is supposed to be going on. Um, the other thing that I think is really important to take away from monotropism is that autism is not actually that mysterious. It is possible to make sense of. Um, a lot of people seem to have just given up on trying to make sense of autism and I think that's just a huge mistake. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the future of autism theory. I only have uh, less than a minute to go, so there's not that much I can say. Um, I'd like to see a lot more people working on autism, a lot more re uh, researchers looking at monotropism, um, finding ways to empirically test it, exploring the implications in practice, exploring how it relates to things like trauma, um, CPTSD, uh, how all of this relates to other intersections of experience, um, gender, gender diversity, racial and cultural differences. We should be looking at autism as part of human nature. Um, and a complete theory of autism has to be part of a complete theory of human nature. So we probably have a fair way to go yet. I think that's me. <laughs>